Good evening. Um, I'm hoping the Harry Potter fans amongst you will recognize the whip spider. Um, I'm a biologist who um, studied a lot of biology, zoology, genetics, microbiology, and then got really interested in engineering and has sort of swapped across and do a bit of biology and engineering now. So that's a whip spider. Thankfully, it's not a very big whip spider. They can grow up to about 10 inches, sort of 25 centimeters. And I've been interested in how sort of insects, spiders, um, sense their environment. And if you think about a spider, the first thing I thought about really was their eyes. Um, and you can't really see it on this image because I wanted to get my face in it. But at the very front of this, um, <laughs> at the very front of this spider are two small, two eyes on stalks, two median eyes. And the easiest to think about is like a lobster. Um, so lobster type eyes at the very front. And then immediately behind that, either side of those two eyes, are three further eyes. So a total of eight eyes on that spider. So as a biologist engineer thinking about sensing the environment, you'd have thought insect vision, spider vision would be pretty good with eight eyes. It's really poor, it's relatively poor. And instead, like all of us, you use a range of different sensors to be able to sort of measure your environment. But the beauty of nature is nature has evolved such simple ways of measuring that, of simple ways of basically um, being able to measure and understand the environment around it, but does so so efficiently, um, does so so robustly, and in really, really extreme environments, which for me as an engineer is kind of quite important, certainly as I work in defense. So basically the spider to sense its environment uses a combination of its vision, but also the hairs, on its body, which measure pressure and vibration. And by using those combination of sensors, what the whip spider does, and that's why we like the whip spider, is these two appendages at the front launch out, grab its prey, and pull it back into the mouth parts, um, just like a prey mantis. Um, so that's why I like, um, that's why I like whip spiders. <laughs> okay. The other reason for liking whip spiders is because they're in Harry Potter and I have a lovely scar. Um, and I've also been working on invisibility. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about spiders tonight because I know there's some arachnophobics in there. So um, I'm not going to talk about spiders. That's another, another presentation. But what I do want to talk about is the way in which animals sort of monitor their environment around them and the movement of air around or the movement of fluids around objects. So we think about the way in which water moves around animals and also the way in which air moves around um, or gases move around objects. So I'm very fortunate to work into a, in a field of um, biology and engineering, a field known as biomimetics. And all I do really is steal ideas from nature and move them across into engineering. It's really, that, that is my day job. Okay? And, and the way in which I, I sort of take that inspiration is, my view is that 3.6 billion years of evolution or trial and error can't be that wrong. And we should be perhaps learning more from nature, understand how they've come up with those solutions, because they're relatively easy to copy, as you will see, and move across into, into engineering. So for me, the whole reason I ended up in this was because of penguins. I was sat in a lecture one day, and this guy, this professor, was telling me about how efficiently penguins swim. And I sat there thinking, penguins are birds, okay? Penguins are birds that can't really fly. Their penguins can't even walk properly, okay? They've got big bellies, and they slide along on their bellies. Um, so why should penguins be able to swim so efficiently? But wow, do they swim efficiently. Um, and the beauty about penguins as well is not only can they swim incredibly quickly, but they can maneuver themselves through the water. And it's really that combination of a bird that can't fly being able to outswim fish to catch its prey. And it's by understanding the way in which penguins can swim efficiently um, means that we can start to design better ships, better submarines, etc. Um, and the, the key thing to a penguin, I want to point out, is at the very front, this beak, okay? So it's the beak and the feathers, and it's, that's really important. So that whole beak piece. And if you think about a penguin's beak, so the first thing that's going through the water is this really hard surface, okay? So a bit like the, the, your nail. Um, this hard beak, which then progresses into feathers. And if you imagine that progressing through the water, what's happening is the water hits that smooth beak surface, and then as it hits the feathers, it hits that different, different surface. And what happens with the water, or what we call the boundary layer, is the boundary layer gets changed. It actually gets tripped and changes in the way it flows. Now, I didn't believe any of this, so I actually wanted to go away and test it, and nobody had let me do it. 
So what I managed to do was basically talk to Chester Zoo. Chester Zoo throws me a load of penguins. I spoke to the Natural History Museum. <laughs> I spoke to the Natural History Museum, and the Natural History Museum said, yeah, th th we've got this museum in Tring that's got all the Scots penguins. You can go and play with those. If you want to go and measure all of those. Um, and then I went to see the MOD, and the MOD basically said, yeah, we might be interested in that. This is our submarine test facility. If you want to go and build some penguins and put them in there, you can do some test work. And, and I swear, that is exactly how this biologist got into engineering and got into defense. So what we're looking at is a pretty ugly picture, really. But um, this is a fiberglass penguin, OK? I wasn't allowed to put real ones in. I wasn't allowed to put dead ones in. Um, and this penguin is covered in bands. These are bands of paint. They're um, what's called a non-drying paint. And the reason we do that is to be able to visualize the flow over the penguin, OK? So we're about to drop it into what's called a circulating water channel. Uh, think about a wind tunnel that's full of water. That's basically what this is. Um, so three-story building, great big loop of water, and you put your penguin in the top of it. Normally used for submarine testing. What we see on the next slide is some of those models as they come out. So basically, what you can see there is the bands, the paint sort of being with, sort of drawn away from it. And what's actually happened is, I'm going to do a bit of a Titanic moment here. OK, so if you imagine being stood on the bow of a ship, Titanic, um, <laughs> and the bow wave that you get at the front of it. So if you're stood at the front of a ship, you find this big V coming off the front of the ship. So the boat is actually pushing this huge V of water. And what's happening with that water, like the penguin here, is that the water is basically running away from the ship or running away from the penguin. And what's happening with the paint in this instance is the paint is being pulled away off the bird, um, so you're getting basically no paint on there. What we did is we made one change. OK, one change to the penguin. And that was to fit a ring of feathers around the beak. So as before, I was saying it's really important that we've got this beak and then these feathers. All we did was fit feathers on the edge of that beak. So three mil deep, these, penguin, these little feathers stood. And what happened there is as the water, as I said before, hits this ring of feathers, it causes it to become a little turbulent, and it sticks to the body. So what we're now seeing in this image below is instead of on the bow of that boat, the V forming, the water's actually following the bow of the boat, so it's becoming more efficient. And simply by fitting that tiny ring of feathers around the front of the beak, we got a 13% increase in efficiency. OK, so a 13% more fuel-efficient bird. I'd love to have a car that's 13% more efficient. Okay? Um, and what's happening there is the reason you can see a black rear end of the bird um, is because all of the paint is being drawn along the body and brought to the back. So m just by putting these small amount of feathers on there, huge increase in efficiency. But what was also important in this was that, as you can see at the back here, all the paint has collected. And if you think about a penguin, um, a penguin at the very back of the bird has got its feet. Its feet get tucked in the back here, and it can also move its tail. So if we now think about its maneuverability, um, the whole purpose of you focusing all that water at the back end means that by simply moving your feet a small amount or moving your tail means that you have a much more efficient rudder system. Um, so not only increased efficiency, but also rudder system. So that's basically what I did as a, as a student. I want to now think about actual birds now. I've always been interested in feathers, really. Um, I own a Bengal eagle owl, which is kind of quite cool. Um, again, staying on that Harry Potter theme, yeah? OK. Um, so but what you're looking at here is if you think about it, so this is a, a dead crow on a light box. And what's really important or interesting here is if you think about a feather, and because I really do own an owl, I brought one of its feathers. OK, so if you think about a feather um, and the wing of a, of a bird, or the, as I'm interested now in the wing of an aircraft, um, that wing consists of basically what is a porous structure. I can take that wing and blow through it, yeah? Um, what's the function of a wing? The function of a wing is to maintain a higher pressure beneath it whilst lower pressure above. But if you think about at the, what we call the leading edge or the front of the wing, lots of feathers are all layered on top of each other. And as we move further back, there's less and less feathers, OK? So there's almost a porosity gradient. So you've got higher porosity at the back end than you have at the front. 
to maintain that pressure gradient across the wing. And again, we've been interested in understanding basically bird flight and how we could better engineer um, future aircraft. And what I really want to talk about today is the work that we've been doing on redesigning aircraft and almost scrapping the way in which you think about aircraft flight and the way in which we think about aircraft maneuverability. So this is the interesting stuff, really. Um, as a business, BAE is working on future unmanned air vehicles, um, has been for quite a long time, um, but really looking at increasing the efficiency of, um, of aircraft. The beauty of efficient, increasing efficiency means that we can stay in the air for longer. The other advantage of unmanned air vehicles is we haven't got a person in there, we haven't got a pilot in that aircraft. So the G-forces that you could start to pull in those sorts of aircraft is incredible. Uh, what limits a jet fighter at the moment is not the equipment or the materials, but is actually the pilot who blacks out at about 6G+. Plus. So if you don't have a pilot in there, we can make incredibly maneuverable aircraft. Um, and that's what we're going to look at trying to do. Okay? So future unmanned air vehicle. I'm going to say UAV quite a lot. That's why I've put unmanned up. So let's go to conventional aircraft. I'm kind of hoping you're all pretty familiar with this. I certainly am. Um, sitting on the back of an easy jet flight, um, commonly see this sort of, sort of view. Look how complicated that is, OK? So to basically be able to roll our aircraft, all these different mechanisms, um, all hydraulically driven, they're incredibly heavy. It's a really inefficient way of, of controlling flight. Um, so if we could look at redesigning that, um, if we could look at taking all of those hydraulics out of there, not only do we get a weight saving, but we get a massive increase in, um, in reduced maintenance costs and downtime um, of, of the aircraft. So BAE set a challenge, actually now about four, four or five years ago, which was to look at no moving part wings. So could we design an aircraft with no moving parts other than the jet engine? Okay. And that's what we've set out to do. And by using very, very simple mechanisms, by understanding the pressures around objects and the airflow around objects, you can start to redesign, redesign wings. One of the concepts that we came up with, or working with universities came up with, was basically if you take a piece of paper and you blow along the top of it, you can get the paper to turn up. Okay? And if you blow along the bottom, you can get it to turn down. And we thought that was kind of quite cool <laughs> and quite easy way of controlling air. So if we think about what was that really complicated rear end or that back end or trailing edge of an aircraft, and we now think about this red spot here, OK? So that is now the back end of our aircraft. And what we do is we pressurize inside that or pressurize a range, an area of that. So as the air is flowing over the top of the wing, we bleed a little bit of that pressured air out of the top which actually causes the airflow to move down. So if we take the trailing edge of that aircraft now, we've got a pressure source behind it, and we start to open a gap above and below, we actually get the air moving in a straight direction. If I then move that ball, move it down a little bit, so now I'm bleeding air out of the top of that trailing edge, I can actually get the air now to move further around. And I fully open it, and I can actually get to almost 90 degrees. So that's all very nice, simulation will show us anything. Um, we now need to be able to build something and, and really test it. So this is a process called the Coanda effect. And what's really interesting is not only does it work with paper, but it's the whole reason that snow sticks on the back of telegraph poles. Um, because of the way in which the air moves around, it forms a vortex and, and sticks back on the, on the underside. So to show that this really works, we built lots of models, working with universities and students. This is a, a relatively simple model in a wind tunnel. Um, and what we've got here then, so that's looking at that trailing edge of the wing. We've tied some bits of string on it because we couldn't afford anything else. Um, and what we're doing here then is we're going to control the air movement, OK? So we're going to blow, we're going to move that ball to open the gaps to move the air down. And you can actually see the wing moving as we do that. So very responsive. So purely by changing the pressure that we bleed out the back end of the aircraft, we can start to roll it. The interesting thing as well, for anyone into aeronautics, um, if you think about thrust vectoring, or you think about control of air out of the back of an aircraft, or the thrust of the jet, we can do exactly the same thing. So now we can not only change the roll of an aircraft, but we can also change the pitch. 
So here we have thrust vectoring coming out of the rear of the aircraft off the jet and also control of the trailing edge. So that's only a wind tunnel model. Um, but very, very simple experiment showing that simply by just controlling the pressure out of the back end of an aircraft, you can start to really control it. And that was really the challenge we were looking at trying to, trying to develop of scrapping the way in which we've all been taught how aircraft fly and thinking about aerodynamics completely differently. And that's why this whole program involved um, a huge range of different universities to also get the engineers, the new engineers, thinking differently about the way in which they design aircraft. So the penultimate of this is, this is an aircraft called Demon. Um, it's a radio-controlled jet engine. Um, it takes about 80 kilo payload, so it does need air clearance to be flying or flight clearance to be flying. Um, and the whole control, full takeoff and landing of this aircraft is purely by controlling the air out of the, out of the, out of the wings. So there are no flaps. There is a rudder system on this one that is controlled. But full maneuverability, <laughs> it did actually land. <laughs> OK. okay. Um, right, so this is the back end of the aircraft. So as we started looking at penguins, and we started looking about the flow of, air, of liquids across penguins, um, where we are nowadays is this is the back end of that model uh, of the Demon aircraft um, coming out of a flight trial, uh, where you can see the flow lines across it. So my message really is that I do think there's a lot to be learned from nature. I think there's a lot to be, um, a lot to be learned from evolution, um, not only of of current animals, but I think of, of animals prehistoric as well, that um, so much can be learned. Um, and so much of it can be very easily transferred into engineering to make much more efficient systems than we do already, um, and really look at changing the way we think about um, designing not only materials, but also um, engineering structures. He says, thank you very much.